This episode is scripted by John Ruths and Newell Fisher and is narrated, recorded and edited by Newell Fisher. It is dedicated to Samantha the Wonder Dog, who John Ruth sadly lost this week. Hello, a happy new year and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 45, in which we will be going through chapter 43, The Great Patrol. One bit of borough keeping, I have at last managed to catch up with the episode notes which had gone unupdated for two months due to family circumstances. I will be keeping up these from now on and thank you for bearing with me. So, let's welcome in 2022 with the prologue to the most violent events of Watership Down. John Ruth's notes on this chapter are really good and for this episode I've decided not to edit them at all for my English voice or my personal preferences. I always have the time to do this, and John has no issue with me doing so, but the removed cultural perspective of this chapter makes this seem appropriate. Chapter 43. The Great Patrol. The pre-chapter quote is military in nature. It is from Napoleon by Walter de la Mer. You might think that this was a French poet writing about his maybe national hero. Alas, no. Walter de la Mer is English. This is no snippet. His poem is complete. Just seven simple lines. It's clearly about the French army in Russia. Terms like incessant snow and northern sky tell you this. This was as much a disaster for Napoleon and his army as it was for the German army many years later. Much of what beat the French and led to the Germans was simply harsh winter conditions. In some ways, the quote is foreshadowing, as, as many of Richard Adams are, but it is also somewhat reflective, as we'll see in the chapter. All in all, though, I think it's meant to be more reflective than foreshadowing. In this case, I'd, I'd compare the French army to the Afrofans. Here goes. Well, much like the pre-chapter quote, this chapter is quite reflective. Adams' use of free discourse enables us, the readers, to get inside of the heads, aka point of view of others, in this case, mainly General Woundwort. We've learned much about Woundwort, what he's like, how he built his warren, how he developed complex social and military systems, and even about his rabbit kittenhood. This chapter gets us into his thought process and how these lead to action. This chapter also tells the Afrofan side of things from the moment that the little punt floated down the test and concludes when the Afrofans are ready to begin their attack on Watership Down. It stands out and is one of my favourite chapters. The way it is written and how it fills in the gap of what happened from the Afrofan point of view has always appealed to me. We learn what we've already suspected. The very first sentence of the chapter says it all. The unexpected departure of the escapees has damaged the prestige of Afrofa. As I stated before, we both come from nations that understand this concept quite well. We smile and celebrate when we see our nations do something well. Obversely, we cringe when we see the opposite. The successful escape made the Afrofan Ausler look stupid and its success may be giving other frustrated Afrofan rank-and-file rabbits hope. In spite of the Afrofan Alsna failing and being somewhat surprised and defeated by our heroes and Kihar, Woundwort stayed up most of that night devising his own plans. So, while our heroes floated to freedom, Woundwort was already preparing a counterstroke. Woundwort makes an interesting comment about Vervain knowing what, mar what the Marks are saying about the escape. Vervain is in charge of the Auslaffer. This is the council police, but I'd argue it's also an internal security wing of the Warren. Just as the Owlsler worry about outside threats and go on wide patrol, the Owlsler looks internally. To me, it feels very Stasi-like. This also gives me an idea of who may have been the inspiration for both Vervain and Woundwort. Respectively, I think it was Joseph Stalin and Laurenti Beria. Just an idea of mine, and I'd say that between the two, there is a closer match between Vervain and Beria. We get to see how Woundwort is among his rabbits within the systems that he devised. He's pretty civil overall, but does use his influence to get his, his way. He also senses some opposition, but he seems to know how to deal with it. What's clear is that the prestige of Ephrafa needs to be repaired. He's got some rabbits, mainly the ho somewhat holly-like campion, that can contribute. Woundwort decides to pick his best rabbits and conduct some reconnaissance. Woundwort initially leads, is relieved by Vervain, who is then relieved by Campion. We have already guessed this pecking order, but this makes it clear. It also proves fruitful. Campion and his patrol come back now knowing where Watership Down is. There is an enthusiasm upon this being reported, however Woundwort is not one to rush to failure. 
Rather, the Afrafans will train for this mission. Even taking on volunteers from the rank and file, this is smart and prevents Afrafra from emptying out too many valued Ausler members. Woundwalt selects rabbits that will match what this mission requires, and it seems that movement speed is the primary consideration. The psychological effect of selecting rank and file rabbits is not lost on Woundwalt. The training that takes place is interesting and is a more complete version of how Bigwig trained warship down rabbits for the raid on Nuthanger Farm. Moondwart even makes a f more full reconnaissance trip near Warship Down with Campion and two other Owsler. He learns from, th from this and now knows what side he should approach. 26 or 27 rabbits are chosen. Interesting because we know that there are a total of 26 rabbits in Warship Down. However, this includes 10 does, so the Afrofans will effectively outnumber our heroes. This very large wide patrol heads to Watership Down. Moondwart's personal touch is every seen everywhere. He leads personally, decisively deals with a couple of stoats, and just seems to know what to do in every situation. At one point, the very large group are broken down into smaller parts for more effective command and control. We've seen this before, and this is very much like the Warship Down rabbits when they were en route to Refrefer. After they more or less made the trip, Woundward orders his large group of rabbits to take rest until sunset. So far, all has gone well. This group feels like it's a long way from home, and they are. This is an indicator, and you have to suspect that it never before has Ephrafa gone this far away on a mission like this. Then something serious slips. Local mice and yellowhammers see the rabbits. We, of course, know that this word gets to Hazel, and this leads to the, the quick scouting by Holly and Blackavar. Suddenly, the rabbits of Watership Down know about the Afrafans, and there will be no surprise attack as previously planned. This does not deter Woundwort. There is no way this would happen anyway. After making this significant trip with a large number of hand-picked rabbits, the upcoming breaching attack on Watership Down will happen. Plus, how could Woundwort depart at this point? There is just no way that this can happen. Simply by arriving, Woundwort and his Afrafans have crossed their own Rubicon. The attack will happen soon. As the Afrafans are preparing for this, we now intersect the ending of the last chapter, when Hazel was above ground looking for them. Hazel is nearby, and makes his way to, the, to a group that Woundwort himself is with. Hazel and Woundwort talk. In the ensuing conversation, it's clear that Woundwort thinks that Bigwig is the chief rabbit, and that Hazel must be some trusted messenger. Hazel also has the limp he earned at Nuthanger Farm, and Woundwort may even think that he was sent as a possible sacrifice. Woundwort drives the conversation. When they talk about terms, Woundwort incorrectly treats it like a question rather than an agreement that they should come to. Woundwort also makes his inevitable judgment error when Hazel proposes something that sets these two apart as Warren leaders. Woundwort will not be seen to cooperate with the same Warren that essentially stole from him. Adam symbolically uses the sun dipping into a cloud bank to symbolise Woundwort's error. After this conversation, Campion offers to kill Hazel. However, Woundwalt would use Hazel in his own brand of psychological warfare. He'll allow him to take his terms back to Watership Down. Hazel can't even reply to Woundwalt's terms. He's basically disregarded by the Afrofans, which functionally is the same as being dismissed. This was a nice touch on the part of Adams. There being nothing else that needs to be done here, Hazel heads back to Watership Down. Amazingly, Hazel's life was saved. Seeing it as his responsibility, he willingly took on the task of attempting to talk with Woundwalt. Knowing that he can no longer surprise the attack rabbits of Watership Down, he chooses to make Hazel his fear messenger, having no idea that he has made another critical error. He let live his adver adversary, who is better at leading a warren than Woundwort was ever capable of. Next time. The Siege of Watership Down begins. Mm -hmm.